Excel's group by function allows us to take tabular data like this and create pivot table style output without creating a pivot table. I've made a video explaining the syntax and use of group by with many, many examples, and I'll put a link for that video in the video description, as well as a card up here in the corner. But I want to expand on something that I didn't show in that other video. The original video locks us into performing a single aggregation, like a sum, average, max, min, count, median, that sort of thing. But what if you need to show multiple aggregations, like totals, averages, and median sale at the same time? Let's see how we can go beyond the single aggregation selection with group by and tell as many stories as we like. At the end, I'm also going to show you how to create a selection interface. So this way we can let the user pick the aggregation category, like do we want to aggregate by product or by region or by supplier, and then even sorting logic, sort by the category or sort by the sales. This file is available for download so you can follow along with me as I develop the project, but also see everything in a completed state. The download file also includes all of the notes you would need for the formulas and explanations of what these elements do. So let's get into it. We'll build the solution in pieces, that way we understand exactly what each element is responsible for. Starting with the data, we have a proper data table, and if I go up to Table Design, I can see in the upper left corner the name of this table is Sales. When we refer to a column in this table, we'll click the column heading, and that will select the table and field name. So let's go over to cell H4, and we'll begin with just a basic group by function. So equals group by. The rows that the group by function will scan to perform the grouping operation, we'll start with a hard-coded product column. So we'll click the heading for product, and that will select the sales tables product field. Comma, the values that will be aggregated per product will be the sales field. So sales table, sales column, comma. And then the aggregation we want to perform, we'll do a sum function. Close parentheses, and here's the output of the group by function. We've grouped by product and aggregated each product sales with a sum function. The table is sorted in ascending order by product. Also, notice there's a lack of a heading row, and we do have a total row at the bottom. All of these things are going to be changed. We've accepted all of the default settings for the additional arguments in the group by function, but I like to expressly state them. That way, as a form of documentation, I know exactly what is happening here. So I'll click in the formula bar. After the aggregator, I'll hit comma, and here it's going to ask me how I want to display headers. Do I have them, or do I need to generate them? I did not select the heading fields from the table because I'm going to use my own custom headings. So don't use any of the originals, and I don't wish to generate them, so that's a zero. Comma, now for the grand totals and subtotals. I don't have any subtotals, but I do want to show the grand totals, and I want to show them at the bottom. So that's going to be a one. Comma, the sort order, this would be the column position of the output that I wish to sort by. If I want to sort by product, I'll put a one. If I want to sort by the sales, I'll put a two. A positive number indicates an ascending sort, a negative number indicates a descending sort. So if I put a one here, that will be an ascending sort by the first column. Hit enter. Now, I'd actually like to do a descending sort by sales. So going back into the formula, I'm going to change this from a 1 to a 2. So sort by the second column. And since I want this to be a descending sort, I'm going to make it a negative 2. Enter. And now we're doing a descending sort by sales. Here's where we go beyond what we did in the original group by video. Going back into the formula, the function argument only allows you to select a single function for the aggregation. Backspacing off the sum, we can see here's a list of all of the functions that we could pick, but we can only pick one of them. I wish to pick multiple arguments. The trick is to integrate an hstack function into this argument. This way we can list multiple aggregations. So let's put it in hstack, open parentheses. An hstack will not list the function arguments like group by, so you just have to know what their names are and type them in. The order you type them in is the order they will be presented in the output. So I'd like to start with a sum function, my second column will be an average function, and the last column will be a median function. Close parentheses, hit enter, and now we have multiple columns of aggregations. When you do that, even though I've told it not to display a heading row, it does automatically list the function names because it needs to know which function belongs to which aggregation. I'm going to create my own custom headings, so I need to suppress these. Let's expand the formula bar. I'm going to take the entire group by function and wrap it inside of a drop function. The drop function allows you to discard a certain number of rows from the beginning or the end of a table. So the first argument will be all of the group by's output. The second argument 
will be the number of rows to drop from that table. I want to drop the first row, so I type in a 1. If I wanted to drop the total row, I could obviously just turn that off, but if this was some other kind of data output, I could do a negative 1 to discard the total row. Close parentheses for the drop, hit enter, and now I've discarded the aggregation headings. Because I might want to go in here and type in my own headings, like these. So looking back at the formula, creating multiple aggregations revolves completely around using this hstack function and then listing each aggregation name. Now let's see if we can jazz this up and let the user pick the category as well as the sorting algorithm. Let's begin by creating the titles for the user interface dropdown lists. So in H2, we'll put something like this, and then H3, something like this. Now let's dress them up. For both of these, we're going to use data validation dropdown lists. I want the user to be able to select between product, state, region, and supplier. Since those are all nicely together as headers in my original table, this will be simple. We'll go to I2, go up to data, data validation, and we'll allow from a list. And the source of that list will be these four cells from the source table. Hit OK. And now we have a dropdown that the user can select one of these four. For the sort by, we'll ask them whether they want to sort by the selected category or the total sales column. So these are just going to be hard coded. We'll go to data validation, allow from a list, and the source of this list will either say category or total sales. Hit OK, and now we can choose category or total sales. This hard-coded title will need to change, so if the user picks supplier, I need this to say supplier, and if they pick state, I need this to say state. So we'll replace this hard-coded title with a link, equals, and then I'll click on cell I2. Hit enter, and now whatever the user picks from this dropdown is what it's going to say as the title. Now back in the group by function, we need to change two static entries into dynamic entries. The first static entry is what we're grouping by, and right now we're locked into the product column. We need that to reference whatever the user selected here in cell I2, but unfortunately we can't just click I2 and hit enter. It doesn't work, because supplier doesn't mean anything to the group by function. It has to point to this particular table and then this particular column. So I2 still needs to maintain the structured reference to the selected category. It would be nice if we could go into the row fields argument, point to the supplier column, but then in the square brackets, replace that with a reference to I2. Unfortunately, when we do that, it doesn't work because there is no column name in the sales table named I2. What we'll need to do is construct a structured reference that takes the user's input and points it to the appropriate column in the sales table. Let's get rid of this. To do this, we're going to use the indirect function. Now, everything in the structured reference to the table that is constant will be static text concatenated with the dynamic pointer to cell I2. So we'll start with double quote sales, and then after the open bracket, close double quotes, ampersand the reference to I2, ampersand double quote close square bracket double quote, and then close parentheses for the indirect function. So this takes sales bracket concatenates it to whatever the user selected in I2, in this case supplier, and then closes it off with a square bracket. If we were to highlight this function, we can see in the pop-up that it's actually constructing the list of suppliers. If I change I2 to state, that would be a constructed list of states. We'll hit enter, and now we've given the user the flexibility to come to I2 and switch this to state and get a list of states. If they switch this to region, they get a list of regions. And that's all because of the indirect function. Indirect is what is known as a volatile function, and we try to stay away from volatile functions if at all possible, but for this small of a scale, there's no reason not to use it. The next component is to allow the user to select whether they wish to sort by category or by total sales. Looking at the formula, we're hard coding in the sort logic as to sort by the second column in descending order, but I want the user to be able to pick between the first column and the second column. If they pick the first column, I want it in ascending. If they pick the second column, I want it in descending. Now the governing logic here is, if they pick total sales, I want to sort by the second column. But if they pick category, I want them to sort by the first column. Now category is not a thing that they're picking. Remember, they're picking from up here by the words region, product, sales. So we're not going to look here to see what that title is. Instead, we're just going to make the logic simple. If they pick total sales, we sort by the second column. If they pick anything else, in this case category, we'll just sort by the first column, regardless of the actual category that they've selected. So back in the formula, we're going to take this negative two, which says sort in descending order by column two, and we're going to replace that with an if statement. 
The test will be simple. If I3 equals total sales, comma, then sort by the second column in a descending fashion. Otherwise, just sort by the first column in an ascending fashion. So we're really only keying off the fact that they chose total sales to make the decision. And an additional close parentheses for the if statement, hit enter. Since I've selected to sort by category, I'm in alphabetical order by region. Let's see this a little easier if we choose something like state that has a lot of entries. So we can see this goes all the way from Alabama to Wyoming. If the user were to choose to sort by total sales, then we're sorting in descending order by total sales. So now they have the flexibility to choose something like product, sort by total sales, or sort by product. If I choose supplier, then I'm sorted by supplier. Notice the dynamic title. The only thing left to do is to give this a bit of artwork. So I'll take the heading row and just statically change its colors. Next, I'd like to have a simple thin line grid around all of the output entries of the group by function. I can use conditional formatting for this. Now the consideration here is you need to highlight as many cells as there may occupy output from the group by function. Now since the category that has the most entries is state, I'll go ahead and group by state because then I know that my output will be maxed out here at this row. So I'm going to select all of this information. I'm not selecting the headings and I'll go up to home, conditional formatting, new rule, and I'm going to use a formula. Now that formula is going to say equals and I'm going to point to the cell in the upper left corner. Now I really wish to examine every single cell individually, so I need to take that reference and hit my F4 key three times to remove the dollar sign anchors. This will allow conditional formatting to scan every cell in the selected region. The cosmetic change I want to make, I'll go to Format, and under Borders, I'll put a simple outline border around any cell that has data. Hit OK. Now this will examine each cell, but what is it checking for? I need to check to see if the cell is not empty. So if anything exists in the cell, I want to apply this border. So after my H6 examination, I'll put not equal to nothing. So any cell that has something in it is going to get this border. I hit OK, and I've got borders around every cell that contains information. The great thing about this is I can go up to category, choose something like region, and the artwork changes to fit the data. I'll choose product, I'll choose supplier. The only thing left is to have this total row change its color. That way it's visually separated from the underlying data. Going back to extending this to the largest possible state, no pun intended, that it could be in, I'll highlight everything from the first listed state all the way to the opposite corner of the data. I'm going to scroll back up. We'll go to conditional formatting, new rule, use a formula. The formula is going to say equals, and I'm going to point to the first cell that holds a state, cell H6. Now I want to look at every single state in this column, so I need the row reference to be relative, but I don't want to drift from column H, so I need to have the H reference absolute. So I'll hit my F4 key one, two times. So that way as I scan a row, anything on that row is always looking at column H, but it's relative row to see if there's something there. Now the something I want to look for, so equals, will be the word total. So any number on this row, if the cell in column H of that row has the word total, I want to change it. So we'll go to Format, I'm going to go up to Fill, and I'll choose this blue fill color, and go to Font, and I'm going to do a bold italic font that's white. Hit OK, hit OK. If I scroll down, I can see the total row has now been formatted. Now that total row is on row 56 in the spreadsheet. Scrolling back up, if I change my category to say Product, now that highlighted total row is on row 15. If I change it to Region, now it's on row 11. Producing this type of dynamic report is really a team effort. We use the group by function to create the aggregations, but then also the hstack function to provide group by with multiple aggregation methods. We use the drop function to discard the original headings so we could replace them with more user-friendly headings. We gave the user the ability to pick their category via a data validation dropdown list, but then feed that into a custom created reference for group by. And then finally, we use an if statement to detect whether the user's selection in the sort by dropdown, again provided by data validation, will sort either the first or second column and then by which direction. Finally, we capped it off with a bit of conditional formatting just to make it look like a proper report. Let me know what you think about this in the comments. If you can think of a way that I can improve this, make it simpler, something I may have missed, please put it down in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Don't forget to download this file from the link in the video description. Thank you for watching, and remember, at BCTI, the learning never stops.